progress. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome this afternoon to the Future of Law in Technology and Governance series sponsored by the Center for Governance and Markets at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm Mike Madison, the host. I am a law professor at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law and an affiliate of the Center for Governance and Markets. And my job this afternoon is mostly to introduce and welcome our guest speaker, my close friend and colleague, Orly Lobel, who is a professor of law at the University of San Diego, uh, a phenomenal and energetic scholar and speaker and activist in, in various areas. Uh, she's been working on governance, employment law, law and technology, and most recently, uh, a fabulous new book that she's going to talk about today on the role of artificial intelligence in society and the role that law and regulation should play in, in, uh, in guiding what we do and how we think about what we do with AI and contemporary technologies. Orly's going to give a talk for about 30 minutes, give or take, and then we'll open the floor, have a conversation and some Q&A. So with that, I'm going to mute myself. And Orly, thank you for being here. Welcome virtually back to Pittsburgh. Look forward to having you here with us in person someday again down the road but for the time being uh great to have you on the screen with us and i will let you take it away thank you thank you mike it's always a pleasure to do something that mike leads uh i learned so much from you mike and uh, i actually am gonna probably require you to have a greater role than just introducing me we'll probably be in some conversation because um, you two are uh, certainly a leading expert on these issues of tech policy and AI and the law. And uh, this series is fantastic. Uh, I love the connections that you make between Pittsburgh and uh, Carnegie Mellon and, and the rest of the world who are rightfully thinking about how to, how to think about AI. And that's really a lot of my um, questions that I hear I'm sharing my slides um, that I work through in the equality machine, which are um, not only, you know, where we are with AI, but how to think about AI. Let me just share. My mouse is being weird. Um, <laughs> Sorry, you know how I like to map. Okay. Okay, I'm trying, I'm trying, trying. Here it is. Almost. There it is. Okay, sorry. That that probably <laughs> that was the longest time I could it ever took me to bring a mouse to um, a little nap of sharing. Okay, so um, this might be cut out in the video itself, but um, here we are, uh, the Equality Machine. I'm so excited to be a part of the Future Law Project and CGM, and I. Um, just by way of introduction, I uh, want to say something about why I wrote this book and how it relates to uh, some of the other work that I've been doing. Uh, so I uh, come from the world of tech policy meets the labor market, human capital and talent development, um, platform regulation, and law and governance at large. Uh, I also, as Mike knows, um, think about IP. So for me, it's been kind of this trajectory of thinking about how do we design through public and private uh, partnerships, uh, through the right kinds of relationships, um, laws, regulations, but also structures and design in uh, private industry. How do we create the most competitive, most innovative, and um, kind of most likely uh, structures for for people to thrive, all people to thrive. And I think about kind of access and equality uh, in all these different sectors, uh, whether it's about um, tech or my previous book, You Don't Own Me, and the entertainment and doll uh, industry. Uh, 
in the job market. So I'm the director of the Center for Employment and Labor Policy. Um, and I also advise public or and, and private companies. So so uh, I put a little um, icon here of Fiverr where um, Fiverr is the world's largest um, marketplace, virtual mar marketplace for online services. And I advise them on um, trust and safety, content moderation. And uh, so for me, um, it's very much been a motivating uh, factor to start looking a few years ago at what is happening uh, in reality on the AI side and the accelerated development of so much automated capabilities um, from simple algorithmic decision-making that's replacing human decision-making to uh, more complex uh, machine learning, and now with generative AI and large language models, looking at the reality, the capabilities, and then comparing them to uh, A, how we talk about AI, how we think about AI, and then also how we, uh, we being uh, the regulators and um, agencies and um, legislators around the country, uh, in Washington and um, across the, the globe, how, how do we think about um, the law of AI? And what I show in the equality machine is that we need a more um, expansive, more nuanced um, way of talking about AI. And um, my, my goal in, in the book and in my research has been to really highlight um, the benefits and the um, potential of AI and arguing against the tunnel vision of just focusing on the negatives um, and the risks and the fails that we've seen. So in this slide, we see um, some examples that I um, work through in the book. Um, actually, there's some that come from Carnegie Mellon um, in Pittsburgh, where um, I look at innovations in the healthcare sector, for example, um, bots that are replacing human radiologists. And the FDA actually has just recently approved over 150 radiology um, applications to be deployed in hospitals and replacing uh, human radiologists. Um, Examples from education where social robots have been deployed in various schools, uh, helping teachers and their work of uh, you know, teaching anything from, from math to English to social science. Um, and another uh, image here is of Paro. Uh, I wonder how many of you have actually met Paro um, but a little known fact, I don't know, Mike, if you knew this, that uh, Paro is FDA approved. Uh, so he's this baby seal that has um, been in clinical trials shown to be effective to in, in combating um, Alzheimer's and dementia in uh, uh, patients. And more broadly, uh, Paro actually alleviates loneliness and um, isolation in general for, for uh, people who are um, either in, in uh, elder homes or, or uh, during the pandemic, he, uh, I'm, I'm referring to Paro as he, um, it, they, she, uh, you know, and, and that's actually a, a lot of the uh, equality machine I actually take time to think about uh, how do we think about these machine companions? But um, Pero has um, emotional uh, recognition, AI technology. It has uh, facial recognition technology. It can mimic human behavior. And uh, during the pandemic, uh, New York, for example, subsidized the purchasing of a lot of Paros and deliver them to uh, people who are living isolated to, to help with 
alleviating loneliness. Um, and for me, it's been exciting. I, I actually just got to meet the original designer um, of Paro, who is a Japanese computer scientist. Uh, we, we were both at the big um, AI for Good conference this summer in Geneva, and he was there with the original Paro. And, and finally, the kind of fourth image in this slide is um, alluding to two chapters in the Equality Machine, which are all about our love lives um, and how algorithms have been changing, expanding really the market, uh, the marriage market, the market of dating. I have a chapter that's called uh, Algorithms of Desire and another chapter that's all about sex tech and who's afraid of sex robots? <laughs> we can talk about that too. Um, but really it's just a, it's just a taste of how um, in the book I um, strive to go through uh, the, the full range of um, sectors and ways in which AI has become very personal and has been shaping our lives, transforming our lives um, in very, um, significant ways, uh, whether the way that we work, um, the way that we play, the way that we connect, love, care, um, improve our well-being and our health. And uh, I already alluded to this. This is a, a kind of this thinking of mine and, and the research had been really in kind of sharp contrast to what I was seeing in the um, media exposés about uh, AI and what's happening with AI in um, reports by government agencies like the FTC. Uh, I have a, a companion paper, an article uh, that I wrote um, close to when I wrote The Equality Machine last year that's called The Law of AI for Good, where I specifically take on a Federal Trade Commission report that is kind of just all about the, the negatives and the problems and the, um, how AI is not ready to be um, deployed or used or thought of even um, in uh, how it can combat um, online harms. That was the specific question. But I kept looking at, you know, for, for um, examples of how to be proactive in scaling and in, um, investing and procuring these positive, these really life-saving um, innovations. And at every turn, when I looked at um, Europe and the EU AI Act um, being drafted in Europe, and um, when I you know, examined um, different bills before Congress, um, Biden's AI Bill of Rights from last year, um, Actually, more promising is from last week is uh, Biden's uh, AI executive order. So um, I'll say more about that soon. But but uh, so much of our discourse has been focusing on um, AI risks and harms. And I show how this idea or this mindset of the tech lash of being very um, fearful of the um, damage and um, the um, the risks that are mostly focused on um, AI as being um, excluding um, and and unequal and biased, and then the sister concern AI as being um, used to survey and to extract too many too much data and to uh, um, take away our autonomy. Uh, a, a big argument in my book is that all of that has been uh, perversely narrowing what we can actually be doing with AI um, because um, in a sense it it has meant actually very little regulation. It's an it's a it's a very unregulated area, and it kind of inadvertently means that. Um, only some are developing and kind of running um, fast with um, with 
the the programs, the the software that's out there, the models, and um, it's kind of the a lot of the conversation is insiders versus outsiders, those who care about social benefits and um, equality. Um, a lot of them had been, or there's kind of the voices from outside. Let's you know create safeguards. Let's let's uh, create guardrails. Um, let's slow down. Let's have a moratorium on on um, AI research. You know all kinds of uh, these proposals. Let's ban facial recognition. Um, versus really kind of proactively envisioning, imagining, and harnessing the potential um, of AI to tackle uh, the world's stickiest and hardest problems. Uh, so, you know, one of the things is that obviously, I, I already alluded to this kind of idea of a moratorium or banning AI. Um, obviously on that, I think, um, at this point, most uh, most of us understand that that's not something that happens with um, technology in general, and specifically with AI. Of course, it's not one technology. Uh, I I think that a mindset of and and that has been part of the moratorium that was suggested um, on research of AI. It it had this kind of analogy to the nuclear bomb. Um, AI is not the nuclear bomb. It's not one technology. It's many technologies, a spectrum of capabilities. And um, the train has left the station to, to uh, mix metaphors. We don't put the genie back in the bottle um, with technology. And so that's kind of a first step of understanding it is, it is here, it is being shaped, uh, or sh it's, it's shaping our lives. Um, it is being integrated, being deployed. Um, and so, you know, we all need to have skin in the game to be informed and to say, you know, what what is better than um, other uh, technologies? When do we want to deploy it? How do we want to deploy it? Not, you know, if we want to live with AI because it's here. Um, so that means that we need to think about AI in um, rational ways uh, and we all need to kind of make sure that we are informed and that we're asking the right questions. And um, what I you know, said about seeing kind of this tech lash mindset, I think from that has flowed um, a lot of these cognitive fallacies that um, I spotted in my research in the way that policymakers, regulators, and the general public users and also professionals like physicians um, have been prone to when thinking about automation. And I'm not even talking about, when I talk about cognitive fallacies, about the kind of biggest fallacy of them all, of kind of tunnel visioning into um, a future unknown risk of um, AI becoming a terminator, uh, becoming sentient, becoming, you know, us losing complete, you know, control over machines. We've had that fantasy for, um, you know, for, 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 uh, uh, a lot of uh, human history. Uh, I actually document in the book how we've always had this ambivalence uh, about machines, and um, it it hasn't been um, consistent across different uh, societies. So I actually look at uh, in the book. I look at you know how um, some countries like Japan and South Korea have a little bit of a different um, idea than Hollywood about like how robots um, can serve us versus rise up against us. But uh, again, we can talk about that more, but putting aside kind of how uh, I think that there's something distorting when we think about kind of something that I think most computer scientists don't think is actually in, in our future of losing uh, control over um, these models. Um, what I wanna focus on is the, um, how do we think about automation that is here and now, um, algorithmic decision-making, um, automating human processes um, and, and shifting to um, programs that, that can replace human decision-making. 
So um, the first one, the first fallacy in these categories is what I call the double standard uh, or um, the lack of comparative advantage thinking when we're thinking about automation. So uh, I think the most intuitive and kind of low hanging um, fruit example is when um, we think about whether we will feel safe uh, to enter uh, an automated autonomous vehicle, a, a, an autonomous vehicle, an AV or, or a self-driving car, a robo taxi. And um, I, I ask this when, I, when I'm giving talks around the country, I ask, you know, how many of you are willing to give up the wheel right now um, for an autonomous vehicle? And the, the hands are very few. Uh, people uh, do not feel safe. Mike is raising his hand um, and Mike is uh, an outlier because of course he's been writing about smart cities and um, is kind of familiar with the technology. Um, and they are here. I mean, um, autonomous vehicles here, here, here in California, they're already, uh, you know, you, could be, you can be picked up in the San Francisco airport by an autonomous vehicle. Um, in other uh, states like Arizona, they are serving the public, but people feel uh, quite uncomfortable in general with giving up control. And what um, I'm referring to as the double standard is this, and you see this in um, media reports and, and uh, research and in, in legal research um, thinking and also in um, uh, policy reports, there's kind of this focus on um, if, if there's an accident that an AV um, was was part of, there's an immediate, like, it's not safe yet for deployment um, versus asking the clear question of, is it safer than human driving? What are the statistics about human error versus machine error? And, and again, I think that this is just a clear example with um, self-driving cars, but, this question has to be the question for every shift from um, human to automated decision making. So um, whether we're thinking about programs on sentencing, like uh, you know, human judges to um, programs like Compass, um, are they uh, faring better on um, it, both accuracy uh, in predicting you know, uh, um, recurring uh, offenses um, are they um, being um, are they faring better on questions about equality racial equality um, in the criminal justice system and again the um, the kind of initial discussions at least about compass were aha smoking gun there are you know different rates um, with you know within different demographics and you know that's something that of course we need to flag but what we keep needing to insist on is um, this question of whether an algorithm is outperforming the status quo. Similarly with automating radiology that I mentioned and, and uh, you know, other kinds of uh, hiring apps that um, have AI in sorting to applicants and so forth. Um, and related to that, the, this question of whether um, an algorithm is it's good or bad, is, is safe or um, not yet safe. Uh, a lot of the things that I see in the literature is kind of repeating past fails as proof, as evidence of current um, readiness without really updating um, the, the answer with the advancement um, and, and the ability to correct for past fails. So, Algorithms aren't um, static and they're actually, by definition, machine learning, um, there's a trajectory there uh, that is actually, in a lot of cases, a much more promising trajectory than human uh, learning. So as somebody who teaches employment discrimination, um, who studies human bias, in, uh, in particular in the in workplace context, but uh, across a, a lot of different areas, uh, 
you know, I, I'm very, I'm just acutely aware of how difficult it is for humans to not only understand and recognize our own biases, but even when we do recognize them to correct for them. Um, so, so again, we need a comparative advantage lens of asking if a machine was prone to bias, for example, in a hiring app, is it more likely that we can um, redesign it, that we can feed it more um, uh, data, you know, less partial, less skewed data, more whole, you know, whole and representative data? Uh, can we uh, direct it to constantly audit and check for uh, fair outcomes and, and consistent outcomes across demographics? Versus, you know, what do you do with a human that was prone to bias, like an executive who's promoting um, more more men than women uh, in the job? Again, asking that comparative advantage question about the the improvement trajectory is something that I have seen as lacking in our discussions. Um, another uh, related but very big one uh, that I think has to be part of the conversation in every single context that I just mentioned, from health to education, um, to employment, um, to well-being in general, is this question of cost and um, scaling and scarcity. So um, again, I, I think an intuitive example would be where I'll see reports um, and, and you know, the, for example, the federal, um, Food and Drug Administration has to decide about whether uh, a bot that is replacing a human uh, mammogram reader is, is ready to be deployed in hospitals. You will see report where reports where um, if, if there is a comparative lens taken where um, you, you can see the accuracy of this bot as being at 79% accuracy of reading an, a mammogram. Um, the comparison oftentimes is to like the two best radiologists, you know, trained physicians in the United States. If you take them together in combination, they're still, uh, you know, a, a few percent higher in, in their accuracy. Now that's an important data point, but it also is a, is a very uh, risky and problematic data point. And it has hubris, I argue, in it. Because this idea that the vast majority of the population has access to the two best trained physicians, where we're talking about um, so much scarcity and cost, it's you know it it is a very um, assuming uh, statistic, and and we need to have these honest and frank conversations about. Um, who has access right now to human decision making? What are the the disparities there? Um, we need to have these honest conversations, not only about access in the United States, but across the globe. And of course, across the globe, you know, there's many, many, many women, for example, to continue the example of uh, mammograms that just simply don't have um, access to an annual mammogram um, that is uh, performed by two trained physicians or even one trained physician. So, so we need to have, again, those, those conversations honestly. Um, uh, the fourth and one before the final fallacy is a behavioral fallacy that um, is actually not simply uh, related to AI. It's actually something that we're all prone to in general is that we tend as humans to have this preference for the status quo um, or um, another way to put it is that losses loom larger than risks in our choices and the way that we feel the pain of something that went badly and we um, feel it less uh, or, or think less about the, the things that went right when uh, change happened. Um, and so we're risk averse in, in shifting from, from one system to another. And that has meant that when we're considering, you know, these capabilities that are here and now, and again, I'm, I'm emphasizing that I'm looking at 
automation that exists, that is here. It's not some future um, development. Uh, we, we think about all these risks and you see this in the, in the Biden uh, executive order and, and in, in uh, the Bill of Rights and um, the EUA I, uh, act that, that says constantly think about, you know, um, measure the, the, the potential risks of AI. And again, it, it, it relates to the comparative advantage question. We don't consider, we kind of forget all the problems that are very much in existence in the status quo. Um, and again, there's not shifting. I, this is a big part of my argument. And I think it's a, it's a really kind of contrarian and, um, provocative argument that, and I'll say this in a minute, um, but I think that at some point, like giving up the wheel um, and entering a self-driving car, it shouldn't just be a permissive thing to do, but at some point we might consider prohibiting human drivers from being on the street. I'm not saying it's we're there right now, it's an empirical question, but that should be part of our um, considerations of um, when are we, um, required to actually shift and um, change the status quo. And finally, um, again, I think it's a controversial argument that I make, but there is this assumption in the AI world, mm -hmm. certainly I think maybe from uh, who has been very um, influential in the first kind of initial research on uh, AI and the legal scholarship, um, is that there's this assumption that privacy is um, always kind of a shield, it protects, and um, there's very much a focus on how um, AI data extraction is um, a huge um, risk. Um, can we mute Luna? Um, okay, so, Um, I'll say more about that in a minute. So um, I already alluded to this, so I'll um, go over this really quickly, but I think that at some point uh, we need language, not just about um, the rights to preserve a human in the loop, which is very much in the kind of current AI regulation, but at some point we need to consider when do we have as citizens, as patients, as users, the right when, or, or you know, when we're interacting with governments or, or with companies, the right to actually demand a shift to automation. That's something that, again, we don't have any language about right now. And similarly, just like we need to have rights about privacy, absolutely never denying that privacy is a very important right, uh, but it's we should put on um, a level playing field the rights to privacy to uh, and rights about fuller data collection and acknowledge that sometimes privacy protects, but sometimes it harms, sometimes it protects the more vulnerable and sometimes it protects actually uh, parties who want to keep things secret, um, the, the few um, the people that have more uh, information, inside information and uh, secrets. And uh, again, co data collection uh, and the right to be counted should be part of our um, I think spectrum of rights that we need to consider when we're thinking about AI. So finally, for the final slide, um, I I said this from the beginning that I want us to think more um, clearly about how we think about AI, but um, that also means that um, policy needs to take a more proactive role about on making or helping um, all of us have the right kind of trust, rational trust. In AI, so the um, Biden, uh, President Biden's executive order on AI that's very comprehensive and um, in a lot of ways promising because it's so um, elaborate and how much we need to be looking at what is happening in the world of AI. It's a little bit more balanced. It does still very much focus on the risks, but it does acknowledge the benefits. It has something that's very positive, which is. Um, talking about standardization and having more standards um, so that, and, and this is something that I've been arguing for that we can compare the snake oil to trustworthy AI. Um, but it, it continues this idea of 
which is, it's, it's a good idea that, that we wanna have trustworthy AI, but we also need to shift the lens, not only, you know, onto the spotlight, onto the machines um, and think about, you know, which, which uh, automated systems are trustworthy, but we also need to help ourselves trust the trustworthy uh, automated systems. So um, my argument here is that just like 30 years ago, behavioral um, research was kind of the purview of private industry and uh, marketing uh, departments understood that it really matters how we present information uh, to people and how they um, actually line better with their own wants and desires and shape their preferences. And fast forward only about 10 or so years did public policy really come on board and understand the significance of um, helping people better line up with their own um, goals by being aware that you know we're prone to cognitive failures and um, we need to kind of help through choice architecture, through design, uh, this rational decision making. There is a nascent literature that uh, I'm I, I think I'm part of uh, in thinking about this in the context of AI and automated systems and robots. Um, so in in the uh, equality machine, I take some time thinking about. Um, why do we embody uh, machines and what does that, how does that matter to our connection with them? So embodied robots, which Carnegie Mellon, I know is a very big uh, leader there um, versus disembodied kind of just chat bots, you know, personal digital personal assistants, you know, there's kind of like in our uh, head, um, thinking about why do we make them as humanoids? Uh, why do they we give them certain names? Why do we gender them? Should we gender them? So that's that's a lot of the conversation that we should actually be uh, having. So I'll stop here and um, ready for any and all questions. Thank you. Thank you, Orly. And I see we've been joined by my friend and colleague, Annette. So welcome to Annette V, uh, who in the, the tradition of big, uh, diverse research universities. Annette and I are friends and colleagues, even though I'm in the law school, and she is a digital humanist in our English department and specializes in digital literacy. Uh, so it comes at tech questions from a very, very different foundational starting point. Uh, questions. Uh, so I have a thousand, but I will, I want to prioritize uh, other people's reactions and questions before leaning into my own. No. Okay, well, so as to keep things going. So early, I want to start with your last point about behavioral trust and the interesting phenomenon that you commented on and that we see broadly, which is the sort of materialization of automation, right? So physically, you know, uh, uh, therapy bots and companionship bots and, and other, like, so the idea that we have a different sort of psychosocial reaction to the machines, if we can actually see them. Uh, and, and I think that's an interesting phenomenon in many, many ways. And I wanted to ask about, uh, maybe from a slightly different point of view, but the same topic, um, the sociologist Irving Goffman, and the book, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, uh, meaning that there's a long tradition in social science of studying performance and studying the role of sort of outward facing demeanors and behaviors uh, as a governance system. Right. So we perform a public identity of, ice of ourselves and then we hide you know, privacy in part, but other tactics we use to shield things from public view. And so maintaining that line is a really key part of our individual lives. And it's also a key part of social lives. And increasingly with automation and robotics, I worry that we're not paying enough attention to how AI systems, automation systems, algorithmic decision makings are taking phenomena that have been publicly present in some way that we could in some way see the people or see the systems or see the results and we're moving them off stage we're moving them into private spaces where we can't see them and there's that shift is itself a trigger for a kind of suspicion 
right? I'm happy to get in a taxi cab. I can see the driver in the front seat. In in the Bay Area, in California, where I used to live, I used to ride the what they call the casual carpool, where I was getting in strangers' cars, but I could see a human being behind the wheel. I do know the technology. I know the functionality. I know that I can do the comparative analysis. I'm willing to get into an automated vehicle. But a lot of people get into an automated vehicle and they don't see a human being behind the, the wheel. It's not because they can't do the math, although they might not be able to do the math. It's because there's something about the physical presence of a human being that is part of the trustworthiness equation. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about this aspect of building and questioning trust in automated decision making. Yeah, no, I love uh, the how rich that that question is. And um, it made me think, first of all, I think you have an article about um, soccer referees and, you know, like whether we need um, to still have that warm body uh, present to uh, trust. And, and, and the, the classic example is um, when a long, long time ago, uh, maybe not a long, long time ago in uh, terms of uh, you know history, human history, but um, when when we're thinking about you know how accelerated things are happening right now, but when when uh, trains um, became automated, uh, there was this mistrust or distrust, um, and uh, there was a transition period where there was just a person put in the kind of the front of every train so that the passengers won't freak out. Um, and so, so part of it is kind of this transition. Uh, I see this in as kind of a generational thing of, you know, there's certain um, ways that trust comes when we just are become more comfortable. We like through practice, um, and we don't we we understand that we no longer need that kind of performative part of having um, somebody visible, and we understand that it's been designed. The behind the scenes, there are you know like uh, the the control happened before, and now um, these automated systems are actually more uh, efficient. Sometimes we, I think, by design, need to maybe obscure the fact that there is no. Um, control anymore. So uh, I, I actually am starting a project with um, Mike. I think you know that my husband is a behavioral economist at UCSD on Amir. We've co-authored um, occasionally, and we're starting a new project. Um, he's he's both a behavioral economist and also a, a pilot, um, and we are looking at this. Um, specifically at like how, you know, with, it's ironic that we're talking about giving up the wheel, you know, how difficult it will be for passengers um, in just like, you know, on the street and or, you know, on ground where with um, aviation, a long time ago, the entire world agreed that actually at the riskiest moments, so this goes against the EU, AI bill where like you're assessing the riskiest moments and then you're like, maybe there we need a human in the loop. Um, in the riskiest moments, we've all agreed with um, commercial international aviation that there's gonna be one, it's really literally one computer in LA that controls the entire world. Um, and that when we have you know bad weather, the pilot is prohibited from self landing, you know, or, you know, for landing the plane. It's going to be the the automated system. And um, if we would take the what the EU AI draft and and also California proposals, um, and even like it's already in the GDPR, this idea that we always have to be informed that we're interacting with as consumers, we're interacting with a bot, that a bot is making a decision. There's you know that's kind of part of the rights that are um, promulgated right now, um, you would like, you can imagine a pilot every time there's bad weather announcing to the passengers in the back seats, oh, by the way, I have no control anymore over, you know, the plane, I'm self-landing this, or, or the plane is going to self-land itself. That's going to be really problematic. That's not going to contribute to safety. 
So sometimes it might be that we just don't need to make that so salient, um, you know, that these systems, if we feel like, you know, that's just going to have these um, inadvertent uh, effects. Um, the other thing is that we need to have these frank conversations about what it is that we care about more. So in the context, you know, there's a lot, this has been in the context of adjudication where there's been, um, you know, a lot of writing of how it's really important to have the human face, the human judge before some, like, you know, before parties. Um, and it has kind of this deontological, you know, in and of itself good to have the human interaction. Um, and there the question is, well, you know, how much do we value that more than, um, if, if this is the case, uh, more than accuracy that can come from automation and how do we uh, moderate between or balance between those different values. Um, so, so yeah, I think a lot of uh, important questions here about um, how do we embody, how do we um, design and, and, and what is, what is our, what are our commitments? What are our normative goals and values? And admitting that sometimes there's tensions between them. For example, the right to be informed about you know who you're interacting with and um, contributing to safety and uh, well-being. It may be that there is going to be uh, a direct tension. Um, and one more thing, just one more thought on this is that um, I think that our greatest goal um, and kind of the greatest potential um, in deploying a lot of these systems is actually to preserve a lot of kind of the human interaction. So I give these examples in the equality machine, um, both on um, like the health and healthcare area and education. Um, so in healthcare, it's actually been really rewarding because uh, the equality machine has been selected um, as this year's mandatory um, book for all uh, Stanford med school students. Um, and so I had the um, the privilege of, of being their speaker um, at the beginning of the, the year. And we talked about um, how how physicians should start thinking about like the role of automation and 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 I think what's really coming out is that physicians, for example, don't go into uh, medicine to calculate uh, like drug um, levels to prescribe to do the inbox, you know, things that really create a lot of burnout. They go into medicine for the um, kind of healing side of, of the vast majority of them, I think, want the personal interactions, um, the human, you know, care part of medicine. And what, instead of kind of thinking about the either or, you know, is it a human or is it a bot? We need to think about like, again, comparative advantages of how do we actually create more space and more time for those um, human interactions? And um, I can say the same thing with like teacher um, student interactions um, using AI in freeing up, you know, a lot of those tasks that we really are are less um, excited about, less good about, get more cognitively cognitively depleted uh, from, and so forth. All right, um, Ali, you had your hand up for a while. You want to come back to you? Hi, uh, yeah. Sorry, I got uh, logged out for some reason for a few minutes, uh, so I, I missed a little bit of the last discussion. But um, I just wanted to add. Uh, I, I think you, we were talking a little bit about this in uh, Mike, Mike's last comment and the follow up. But um, I think an interesting, an interesting idea, you know, in in a framework that would consider incorporating AI more broadly into, you know, uh, social interactions more regularly. An interesting part of that, I think, is a transition process. And I would think that a lot of people are, you know, worried about jobs that they could be losing from, you know, being replaced by AI. And this is, I think the transition process is an interesting place where we can deploy, where we can like try to think about, you know, using the skills of those people to help smooth this transition um, towards, uh, 
from you know the current way things are towards a more automated way uh, with a human present until like um, you know we're we're at a stage where we can we can sort of uh, move off of those. So um, I, I don't know. I think like an interesting idea is like uh, an interesting part of that framework would be thinking about you know how humans uh, how humans interact with AI and how like the two can be human activity and AI can be uh, can be designed concurrently to support each other. I think there's an interesting question there too. Uh, just thought I would point that out. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, I One thing that I um, worry about though in some conversations is a conflation between whether an AI system is ready, is good, is is safe, is accurate, does better, like uh, on the side of um, more in inclusion and um, diversity in hiring, for example, versus an HR person. Um, so, so that question about like you know the the AI capabilities and the question of the undeniable um, you know consequences of disruption to the labor market and the need to think about those lost jobs. Um, I think that's, you know, a huge, hugely important question. It is actually in the uh, President Biden's new executive order, as it should be, to think about those um, dislocations to the uh, these shifts, the, the need for reskilling, um, thinking about, you know, new jobs um, and the loss of jobs. Uh, I think that we do need to keep those at least most of the time separate. Um, and so I'll give you an example that's like a very like real example that was happening here just like a month ago in California. Um, Governor Newsom, I think rightfully so, uh, vetoed a bill that would have um, prohibited the deployment of self-driving trucks in California. And that was, of course, um, a lobbying effort uh, by the unions um, to to not, you know, um, uh, result in in the loss of truckers' uh, jobs. Um, I I'm on the side of you know this is the story of human progress. Jobs change. Um, jobs are lost. I've written quite a bit um, on the gig economy. You know these these. These shifts have been happening well before AI. Um, the, the 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 changes in the labor market, the instability and insecurity of the labor market, um, the need for new thinking, new models. And I, I actually, again, I've, I've written a lot about this of how this is a really opportune moment to question, like really straight to the heart, you know, how we um, have been relying too much on this model of single employment for all our social welfare, healthcare benefits, um, reskilling, retraining, pensions, retirement. So I've actually been kind of quite radical in my writing um, well before the equality machine on how we need um, more delinking from kind of this model of stable, you know, one employer um, that gives us all these social well-being. Um, we need to tax um, capital much more than we tax labor. This is a, like a very political, you know, historical uh, thing that was kind of the American model. So there's lots of things that we need to be doing, um, but I don't think that one of them is like slowing down technology when it's here and ready and can uh, be scaled, can uh, be, you know, made more efficient, can tackle you know, poverty and, and um, climate change and education gaps and, you know, all these disparities that really AI does have the potential to tackle. Could, could, we're going to run out of time here in a second. I just wanted to add on to that conversation that uh, having moved to Pittsburgh 25 years ago from California, um, I, I am very sympathetic early to your general observations and perspective. On the other hand, I would say that I am much more aware than I was previously of the human cost of the transition that, um, you know, Pittsburgh as an, as an emblem of deindustrialization and the loss of large scale integrated manufacturing that literally took place 40 years ago. 
Uh, there uh -huh. were massive investments in retraining programs and so forth, almost all of which were failures. It, it just doesn't work. What you end up doing is over a longer period of time, building new educational and training and employment pipelines for the next generation, but the transitional generation just is lost. And, and the community, not just the economic value associated with those old employers, but it's the community integrity uh, that went with that, that also can't be rebuilt. So the thing that helps in California is you have a fluid labor market comparatively because of the history of, of uh, non-competition law in California. And you've got an immigration fueled population, which means rapid turnover that, that goes with the regulatory environment. Pittsburgh or Pennsylvania have neither of those things, right? We have a very stable community in terms of immigration patterns and we have an inflexible labor market. The worst of both worlds, which means that the 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 damage from innovation and industrial transformation is much more salient. It doesn't mean that I'm not not I'm trying not trying to say I'm defending the the Pennsylvania model. Uh, simply that I think as part of this conversation about how we understand and think about AI, you know, there are going to be real costs in terms of reclassification yeah. of jobs, loss of labor. Uh, and so forth. And there will be opportunities created, which may be great, but there will be opportunities largely for different populations of people. Yeah. And, and Mike, I, I, I think in my response to Lee, I said, you know, there, there, are, there is a real cost and there will be real costs and, and we have to have investment and, and, you know, we need to actually think about what failed and, and your description of what failed. I think it's, it is connected to policy that it can't be just retraining programs. It has to be um, direct, you know, social welfare that comes, you know, regardless of whether you're employed. Um, it has to be like um, a lot of these social safety networks that that don't exist and didn't exist um, at that time, where we had this like, you know, model of just dumping everything on getting a new job. Um, and um, and and as Mike knows, you know, I, I definitely think a lot. This is my first two books are all about talent mobility and like uh, thinking that uh, you know everybody should emulate this new entry and more vibrant like um, talent mobility anti non compete um, policy that California adopted uh, a long time ago. And there's a lot of promise right now. So uh, I argue this. 10 years ago and talent wants to be free in my first book. And now this year, the Federal Trade Commission has um, promulgated a new rule that would ban non-competes um, all over the country. So um, if that passes and hopefully it does, um, that's that's a good thing. But then many other things, like, I mean, I, I so again, I, I don't know that what you described as like how it's inevitably a failure has to be always true. Um, I just, yeah, I, I think it will really depend. But but the one more thing to say about this is that we're talking about job losses that are unlike previous um, generations. They're not at the bottom of the like vulnerable, low skill workers. We're talking about changes for lawyers, for engineers, for computer programmers, for architects, for um, what did I say? Physicians, attorneys, you know, like I can't remember, CEOs, whatever. Like it's coming, you know, all through. Um, and so again, it's actually a good moment to think about like our our commitments as, you know, democracies and societies to um, our well-being. And and it's yeah, I think it it will be a different kind of thinking. I think that's actually a really good note to end on for today. A nice, good, open. We need to think about all things, and including all the way up, to, <laughs> all the way up to and including democracy at, in a you know small D and big D sense. I think you're absolutely right to put those uh, into the the conversational space with the uh, automation. Yeah, it needs to be part of a knowledge commons. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Create a, a commons thinking. Uh, you know, <laughs> we should be thinking we about somehow. Right. communities yeah. <laughs> communities and shared information uh, uh on all yes. things. super super cool um so i think we need to we need to put an end to this really interesting and stimulating conversation orly thank you for being here today thank you to the rest of you for being with us and listening appreciate all very very much 
Um, and uh, we'll be back with the series. We'll continue. We've got another talk coming up in, in a month's time. So Orly, as always, great to see you. Congratulations on a fantastic book and all your success with that and with your ongoing research. Look forward to, uh, to chatting again soon. Okay.